And again, we're talking about prayer in the form of sacrifice. And so Dennis Prager, a Jewish man, is asking, okay, well, what about actual sacrifices, like physical sacrifices, the sacrificial system? And he starts to talk about the temple and its sacrificial system and perhaps uh, that being revived one day. Let's watch that. Mm. That the temple be rebuilt and specifically so that we can sacrifice again. And there's no denying the drama of blood and death. Right. So you're you would not dismiss that prayer as as well, odd. I, I, well, I I tend not to dismiss anything that's extraordinarily peculiar off out of hand, right? Because <laughs> there's usually something lurking underneath it. But I mean, in Christianity, obviously, you still have a well, sacrificial. We believe we still have the sacrifice. Well, we participate yeah. in the sacrifice of Christ. Right, it's right. not a. Yeah, not like, so there, Jonathan Pajot is referring again to that Eucharistic sacrifice that we have in the Divine Liturgy in the Mass. It's not a, rep a repeated yeah. sacrifice, yeah. No. Though, isn't it? It's it is a part in... It is a participation, a perfect memory in the participation of the, of the sacrifice of but Christ. It, it is an unusual. And in a making present, when we say perfect memory there, um, or anamnesis, the Greek term, it's a making present. Period. AD 70 is when it disappeared, isn't it? Right. So he's, this other individual, I'm not exactly sure of his name, but he's pointing out, well, this sacrificial system ended with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Destruction of the temple, and they shifted from the temple to the synagogue and from... If I understand it rightly, Dennis, from sacrifice to prayer. To prayer. That's right. Yeah, this is a big deal because in Judaism, Judaism, and in fact, there were many versions of Judaism uh, back then, and one could even argue still today. Um, but back then, it was very diverse, that is Judaism. And what's being pointed out here is that a huge part of Judaism back in the day centered around temple and animal sacrifices. Whereas with 70 AD and the destruction of the temple, you don't have that anymore. You no longer have animal sacrifices. So Judaism had to really take on a different form and it had to redefine itself because one of the most central things to it disappeared. It would, it would be analogous to all of a sudden Christians find out that Jesus didn't rise from the dead and they discovered his bones somewhere somehow you would effectively no longer have Christianity at that point. You would have to redefine things so significantly at that point that it would no longer be what it was. And that's effectively what happened with various versions of Judaism. Not of all, all of them survived, but Judaism had to redefine itself around centering around instead of animal sacrifices and the temple worship now centering around personal prayer and uh, synagogue worship. You did have the synagogue contemporaneous with the temple, but it was kind of auxiliary. You still ultimately had the temple as central. But again, once that's gone, what do you have? Well, you still have sacrifices of praise that is there in the Old Testament, but that certainly was not as central as the animal sacrifices. So again, Judaism kind of had to redefine itself after this. And this is what this individual is kind of alluding to here. And I always wonder, how does prayer fill in for sacrifice? Well, hopefully when you pray, you sacrifice your so own for tyrant, atonement, right? Because what, right. what, that's it. Well, you sacrifice well, yeah, because a lot of time Partly to pray. what you're saying in, is... <laughs> for atonement is, is effectively the answer. But the, the problem is with that is... A very central part for the atonement in the Old Testament, which was obviously not a once and for all. That's why it had to be repeated over and over. But a very central part for that atonement, especially according to the book of Leviticus, is what? The sacrificial system. That's why you have the Day of Atonement in the book of Leviticus. That is so central to atonement for sins. You can't just merely say, well, you could just throw all those things away and you just need a sacrifice of praise. In the Old Testament, no. The sacrificial system was much more central, and your sacrifice of praise was in conjunction with the animal sacrifices. What God did prophesy, however, of in the Old Testament, as we just saw from Hebrews 10, is there will come a time where you'll no longer have this sacrifice because you're going to have a perfect sacrifice to complete these animal sacrifices. But if you don't have that perfect sacrifice, the death of the Messiah, then upon what basis do you just merely discard these animal sacrifices?
you really can't, you just can't. And you can't just say, ah, they, they were more ancillary. You didn't really have to have them. They were more auxiliary in nature. And the more central thing was the sacrifice of praise. Now, when you look at the Old Testament, what central is the animal sacrificial system, not the sacrifice of praise. And yes, it was to be done with a pure heart. Yes, if you're offering your animal sacrifice with an impure heart, obviously that that's going to be a polluted sacrifice and that's not accepted. You do have to have both. That sincere sacrifice of praise mixed with the animal sacrifice. You have to have both in the Old Testament. But you can't just throw away one and not give an explanation for it. Their only explanation well, is that, well, uh, we don't have a temple anymore and so in God's will, uh, he's allowing for us to forego those rituals at the time uh, for the time being. But whenever we can recover those things, then God expects them of us again. But God can't expect us to follow the sacrificial system of the um, Old Covenant because he's not making it possible because we don't have the temple. I would say there's actually a better explanation for it than just that kind of practical, um, uh, practical explanation. I would point out the reason why you're not going to have a restoration of the sacrificial system, the reason why the temple was destroyed, is very clear according to Jesus. If you look at Luke 13, 34 through 35, Jesus says this. He prophesies of the destruction of the temple and he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. Because over and over and over, the people of Jerusalem persecuted the prophets, such as, for instance, Jeremiah. How often I have longed to gather your children as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What is he saying? He's saying this over and over and over. Jerusalem killed, stoned. Uh, and persecuted the prophets that were sent to them. And Jesus even gives a parable where he says, you know, God sent all these prophets and Jerusalem ki kills and persecutes the prophets. Well, God says, well, I'll send him, I'll send them my own son and maybe they'll respect my son. In the parable, no, they didn't respect the son. They killed the son, which is a reference to Jesus and his crucifixion. Um, so here he talks about Jerusalem, you who kill and stone the prophets. He's not only referring to what happened in the past, but he's also saying, you're going to reject me, who is the Son of God. I long to gather you, like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you weren't willing. Now look, your house is left to you desolate. Your house there is the temple. He's saying your house is left desolate. Why? Because on the whole, his very own rejected him. Now, there were some of his own who received him. Those are the early Christians. The early Christians were Jews. This is why I just find it a joke for any Christian who tries to be anti-Semitic. Uh, how, how can you do that when Jesus was a Jew and the earliest Christians were Jews? It's ridiculous. But tabling that nonsense, an obvious problem there, you have this concept that, well, the majority, however, of God's people did not accept him. The majority did it. A few did, and those are Christians. But the majority majority did it, and he says, your house is going to be left to you desolate. This is a consequence of you choosing to not accept me as the Messiah. He prophesies further about this in depth in the chapter, um, chapter 24 of the Gospel of Matthew. In fact, let's look at some of this here, because this is what's really fascinating. Jesus is going to show to you why we don't have the sacrificial system and why this talk of bringing it back is, is absurd at the end of the day. If you look at Matthew 20, 24, let's go to verse, let's start at 27. Yeah, let's go there. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. And so he's saying he's going to come from the east. By the way, this is why Christians historically have prayed facing east. It's called ad orientum worship. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Vultures, that's a reference to the Romans. 
So he's he's doing two things here. He's pointing to his coming, and this isn't the second coming, if you will, uh, though it may be a foreshadowing of it. Um, he's referring to a coming in judgment. And he ties that into something that the Romans are going to do. Well, that's curious. What did the Romans do right around that time? Well, they destroyed the temple in 70 AD. And Jesus even says to them, this generation will not pass before these things happen. So he can't be referring to his second coming because the second coming didn't happen. He's referring to him coming in judgment to judge his people and to destroy the temple. And he uses the Romans to do so. He says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now, obviously that didn't happen literally, but here's what's curious. The temple was seen as a microcosm of creation. It was seen as a microcosm of what's going on with the sun, moon, stars, and the heavens. The temple is a microcosm. It's a mini universe. It's a mini heavens. So when he says the moon's going to be dark and stars will fall from heaven, powers of heavens will be shaken, he's referring to the destruction of the temple, not to a literal, literally the sun is going to fall out of the sky or something like that. He's referring to the destruction of the temple. Then will appear in heaven the sign of man. Listen to that. That's important. Josephus is going to talk about that, which we'll see here in a moment. Josephus is a Jewish historian um, a little bit after the time of Jesus. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. What sign is that? We'll see in a moment. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's a reference to the book of Daniel. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. That refers to evangelization. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, what things? The destruction of the temple. You know that he is near at the very gates. Interesting reference to gates, by the way. You'll see, you'll see why here, according to Josephus. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Was Jesus a false prophet? Did his prophecy fail? If he's referring to his second coming and the end of time, then he's a false prophet because clearly that generation passed away and none of that happened. But he's not referring to his second coming. And he's not referring to the end of the world per se. He's referring to his coming in judgment against the destruction of the temple and the temple being a microcosm of the world. And so we can speak of the destruction of the world in the form of the temple in a mini version, in a microcosmic version. And perhaps these things will also point to a greater, in a foreshadowing way, in a greater way to the end of time, in a macrocosm, maybe. But all he's talking about here is coming in judgment. We also know that because he ties these things into uh, the book of Daniel and some prophecies there that we see uh, with the abomination of desolation in the book of Daniel, uh, which is going to be important, as we'll see here in a moment. But again, he's referring to the destruction of the temple because in this prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, um, it's very clear it's in reference to the destruction of the temple. and That's what the abomination of of desolation is so clearly in the context he's referring to the destruction of the temple and his coming in judgment not to his second coming and the end of time let's actually take a look at some things that josephus said uh, because what josephus said when we compare what jesus just said and corroborate it with the account of the jewish historian josephus it, it just really starts to become fascinating and again, it goes to explain why we no longer have sacrifices and prayers in the form of animal sacrifices. Josephus says this. This is in his The Wars of the Jews. I suppose the account of it would seem to be a fable were it not related by those that saw it. In other words, he's about to tell us something just incredible in nature. He says, and were not the events that followed it of so considerable a nature as to deserve such signals. For before sunsetting, 
chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running about among the clouds and surrounding the cities. He's referring at the time to the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem in 70 AD. He's saying at the time of the destruction of the temple, there were some weird things going on. And people saw in the heavens troops of soldiers in their armors in chariots running about among the clouds and surrounding the cities. That's interesting because what did Jesus say in Matthew 24? Well, he talked about the sign in heaven. There will be, there will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man and the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. The exact same themes, a sign, clouds. You're seeing that being fulfilled according to the testimony of the Jewish historian who did not believe in Jesus, the Jewish historian, Josephus, who also, by the way, links the destruction of the temple prophesied in Daniel to what's going on with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. So Josephus is, is, our, is corroborating the fulfillment of these prophecies, the destruction of the temple in the coming of judgment of the Son of Man in 70 AD. He also points to other incredible signs. He says, I suppose the account of it would be a fable were it not uh, related, I'm sorry, moreover, the eastern gate of the inner court uh, of the temple, which was of brass and vastly heavy and had been with difficulty shut by 20 men. So it took about 20 men to move this gate and rested upon a basis armed with iron and had bolts fastened deep into the firm floor. So not only does it take 20 men to move it, but it's clearly locked into place. It says, which they're made of one entire stone. So it's a large piece of stone was seen to be opened of its own accord about the sixth hour of the night. So already he, he, he's saying, look on its own, this massive gate that takes 20 people to move and it's already fastened into the ground. So it's not going anywhere on its own moved. It opened. Now those that kept watching the temple came here upon running to the captain of the temple and told him of it, who then came up thither and not with, without great difficulty was able to shut the gate again. This appeared to the vulgar to be a very happy prodigy, as if God did thereby open the gate of happiness. So some were interpreting, interpreting this in a positive way. Well, maybe God's going to open the gate of happiness for us. <laughs> but Josephus says, but the men of learning, that is the wise men, understood it that the security of their holy house was dissolved of its own accord and that the gate was opened for the advantage of their enemies so these publicly declared that the signal foreshadowed the desolation that was coming upon them so josephus is saying the fact that the gate opened god allowed this to happen to warn them and show them they are about to have the destruction of the temple you're going to have the siege of Jerusalem. It's going to be sacked. Horrible things happen there. And you're going to have the destruction of the temple. God was giving them warning signs of these things. And then one other. This is curious because God was showing to the people of Israel at this time that their sacrifices were no longer effective. Their animal sacrifices were no longer effective. And in fact, this happened in the last 40 years prior to the destruction of the temple. Now, when was the temple destroyed? 70 AD. What's 70 minus 40? 30. What happened around 30 AD? Around that time? Well, you have Jesus' crucifixion. And you have over and over and over, according to the Talmud, so according to Jewish sources, you not only have these warning signs, but you also have God giving or using miracles and also not continuing certain miracles to show them that their sacrifices, their animal sacrifices, are no longer accepted. 
and it happened in the last 40 years. Well, why would God no longer accept sacrifices of animals in the last 40 years prior to 70 AD? Well, because that once and for all sacrifice of the Messiah was offered. What are some of these uh, testimonies? Well, this is from Tractate Yoma, 39b, um, section 5. And this is from, again, the Talmud. So this is a Jewish source. It says, The sages taught during the timor of Shimon HaTzadik, the lot for God always arose in the high priest's right hand. Hold on, let me zoom in here a little bit more. The lot for God always arose in the high priest's right hand. After his death, it occurred only occasionally, but during the 40 years prior to the destruction of the second symbol, the lot for God did not arise in the high priest's right hand at all. Well, what's going on here? Well, you had lots that were used. In fact, two of them that the high priest used during this time period. And during the Day of Atonement, the lot was usually chosen, the lot that was chosen, again, providentially by God, it would be chosen usually would come up in the right hand. But here he's saying, for the last 40 years, it came up in the left hand every time, which I don't know what the odds of that are, but they seem to be astronomical. That for the 40 times in a row, once every year, it would come up only in the left hand. Well, what did it mean when it came up in the right hand versus left hand? When the lot came up in the right hand, God accepted their sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. When it came up in the left hand, God did not accept their sacrifice, and they had to go and do other further things. So in other words, God was saying, I'm not accepting your sacrifice. Why is that? Why did this happen for the last 40 years prior to the destruction of the temple? Why was God not accepting their animal sacrifice for 40 years? Well, it's because the perfect sacrifice of Jesus had been offered already. Again, this is according to their own sources. The same source continues. So too the strip of crimson wool that was tied to the head of the goat that was sent to Azazel did not turn white. And the westernmost lamp of the uh, uh, candle did not burn continually. Uh, candelabrum, I should say. What's going on here with the... Uh, white um, crimson wool. What, what's going on? The strip of crimson wool. Well, on the Day of Atonement, so you would have a white, if you will, ribbon or a thread tied to the goat that was going to be uh, sent off into the wilderness on the Day of Atonement. You also had another one, another white thread. I'm sorry, it was a crimson thread, I should say. Um, this was tied to the temple door. And it says here, the strip of crimson wool, so it's red, that was tied to the head of the goat that was sent to Azazel did not turn white. For 40 years, this didn't turn white. Well, what's going on? What would normally happen is, by miracle, this red thread would turn white as a sign that God has accepted the animal sacrifice of that goat that was cast out into the wilderness. Again, one is tied, one red thread is tied to the goat, one red thread is tied to the temple door. How do you know God accepted the sacrifice? Well, the temple thread that was, I'm sorry, the red thread that was on the temple door would turn white, miraculously. Well, for 40 years straight, that did not happen. In the last 40 years, until the destruction of the temple, according to Jewish sources in the Talmud, that miracle did not happen. Why did that miracle not happen? The miracle didn't happen because God didn't accept the animal sacrifices because there already is a one imperfect sacrifice that was offered. This is, again, why whenever Dennis Prager is talking about you know, Jews who are wanting to rebuild the temple, God already gave the Jewish people signs that he doesn't accept the sacrifice of the um, animal, animal sacrificial system because it was already prophesied in Jeremiah that you would have a new covenant that would take away that sacrificial system and once and for all take away sin. It's also prophesied in other places. But let me give you one other thing from the Talmud before we look at those. This is um, 
also from the same 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 part of the Talmud. And the doors of the sanctuary opened by themselves as a sign that they would soon be opened by enemies. So that should sound familiar because that's also what um, Josephus was testifying to that we read earlier. Until Rabban Yohan ben Zakkai scolded them. So this um, this rabbi had to rebuke the gates that were opening. This massive you know, stone gate that was locked into place that took 20 people to move. The open by itself, the rabbi had to rebuke it in order to close it. He said to the sanctuary, 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 why do you frighten yourself with these signs? I know about you that you will ultimately be destroyed. And Zechariah, son of Edo, has already prophesied concerning you. Open your doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour your cedars, quoting Zechariah 11.1. Lebanon being an appellation for the temple. So you have a, a prophecy there in Zechariah 11, 1, according to the Talmud, that um, the temple would be destroyed in 70 AD. But what's going on here? Again, a sign is going on telling them, hey, you know, God is saying, hey, this is going to end. The sacrificial system is going to end. This is by my own doing. I'm opening up the gate so that the enemies can come in and destroy this thing. Why? Well, according to Jesus, it's because his very own, for the most part, did not receive him. So God is saying, well, because you didn't receive me in the perfect sacrifice that I offered, your temple is going to be destroyed. Moreover, this is also prophesied in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verses 20 to 27. If you look at Daniel 9, which we'll go to here now, you have a fascinating prophecy, the 70 weeks of Daniel. Let's start at maybe verse 24. 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city. This is um, the uh, angel. I believe it was uh, Gabriel. Yeah, Gabriel uh, shows up to Daniel and delivers him this very important message. 70 weeks. Well, what's 70 weeks? Uh, how, how much is a week? A week is seven, right? So he's saying 70 times seven. 70 times seven what? 70 times seven years. That's 490 years. 70 weeks, that is 490 years, are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin. Wait, wait. According to the book of Daniel, sin is going to be put away with in 490 years. Well, if you're putting away sin, you're also putting away the animal sacrificial system because you're bringing about a perfect sacrifice. That's the only way you can put away sin. To atone for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. This is clear. This is not the animal sacrificial system. It didn't do any of this. It did not put an end to sin, which is why I had to continue over and over and over every year. He's saying this animal sacrificial system is going to end. There's going to be an end to sin, atonement for iniquity, and an everlasting righteousness, which is also reminiscent of the everlasting covenant that the Old Testament prophesies of. To seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that the, from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem. When did that happen? When did the word go out to restore and build Jerusalem after it was destroyed by the, by the Babylonians? Artaxerxes. I forget the exact year. 459 BC? Something like that. But Artaxerxes decreed for the rebuilding of Jerusalem. To restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one. What does anointed one mean? It means Messiah. That what, what does Messiah mean? It means anointed one. It's, those are synonyms. They're the same thing. So the Messiah is going to come. A prince. There shall be seven weeks. So this is, this is revolutionary. He's saying, Gabriel is saying to Daniel, the Messiah is going to come. He's going to atone for iniquity, bring everlasting righteousness, and there's 490 years for these things 
to be fulfilled. Now, have these 490 years passed up? Obviously. We're 2,500 years later. So unless this is a failed prophecy, this had to have happened 490 years from the time of Artaxerxes because he says 70 weeks. And he says, from the word to restore and build Jerusalem. So he's giving you a very specific time period. There's no way around it. Then for 62 weeks, it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time, that is the temple. And after 62 weeks, an anointed one, that is the Messiah, shall be cut off. Wait, the Messiah is going to be killed? Yes, Daniel prophesies that, as do other places. Daniel's prophesying the Messiah will be cut off and shall have nothing. And the prince or the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, what did we see? Well, we saw Jesus. He's the anointed one who's using the Romans to destroy the temple. Here it's saying the people of the prince, who's the prince, that's the Messiah. The people of them, that is the vessel that he's using, the Romans, are going to come and destroy the city and sanctuary. When did that happen? 70 AD. Its end shall come with a flood into the end. There shall be war. Desolations are decreed. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. Interesting. There's notion that there's going to be a covenant made. And for half of the week, it shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. So you're going to have an offer, an end to animal sacrifices. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate. So this is the abomination of desolation until the decree end is poured out on the desolator. Well, according to Jesus, as we saw in Matthew 24, this prophecy, he says, and he applies to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, according to Jesus. So Jesus thinks that this is about um, his time period and the destruction of the temple. And again, you have 490 years from the time of the going out of the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. 490 years from the time of Artaxerxes would put you when? It would put you right around the time that Jesus was crucified. That's when it would put you. I don't think that's a coincidence. I don't know how else to make sense of the 70 weeks prophecy either. It doesn't seem to fit if we're going to put this in maybe the Macca Maccabean time or something like that. Plus, again, Jesus doesn't see it as merely applying to the Maccabean time. He sees it as applying to his own time. And by the way, so does Josephus. Josephus says that this prophecy in Daniel... That destruction of the temple that's being mentioned here, the destruction of the sanctuary, sanctuary, Josephus applies that not to the Maccabean revolt in that time, but he's applying it to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Because it's clear that it's 490 years from the word of the going out, going out of the word to restore it and build Jerusalem. Again, from the time of Artaxerxes' decree, which was, again, I think 459 BC. Somewhere around there, or 456 BC, something like that. 490 years puts you right there at the time that Jesus was crucified. He said, you'll have an end to sin, an atonement for iniquity, an everlasting righteousness. You'll have the Messiah who comes. You'll have the in, you'll have a destruction to the city and sanctuary. You'll have a covenant. What does that sound like? That sounds exactly like what we have in the first century. That's exactly what Jesus did, the Messiah. He ended sin. And so he ended the sacrifices here. As it says, the sacrifices will end. He put an end to them. So all this talk about maybe bringing about the temple not only contradicts, I would say, Jewish sources, but it also contradicts prophecies in the Old Testament. That's why we don't have these animal sacrifices anymore. And again, Jesus connects it to his time period. Jesus says in Matthew 24, 15 through 16, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. And then there's an insertion into the New Testament that says, Whosoever readeth, let him understand. In other words, there's something important here. Pay attention. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. One of the reasons why the believers and followers of Jesus were not 
generally caught up in the destruction of the temple in 70 AD is because they saw the signs and they fled the city because Jesus told them to flee when they see these signs. One last one that I want to bring to your attention, Isaiah 53, that I think is relevant, and we'll finish out the video after that. Isaiah 53 also tells us why we no longer have animal sacrifices. And so when we speak of sacrifice, we speak of prayers, a form of sacrifice, this is why we no longer have animal sacrifices. Isaiah 53 Isaiah says, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the art of the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. So this person is going to be rejected. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their face. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him smitten by God and afflicted. So this person who's going to be afflicted, it's going to look like he's rejected and forsaken by God. We thought that he was rejected by God is what it's saying. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with him and his wounds, we are healed. What's going on there? This person is going to look like he's forsaken and abandoned by God. But in fact, he isn't. He is atoning for our transgressions. And notice this. Because what some people will say and some Jews will say is, well, this is referring to the nation of Israel itself. And certainly you have over and over and over the servant of the Lord in Isaiah being the nation of Israel. That's absolutely true. But the servant of the Lord in the nation of, in, in the book of Isaiah is not always the nation of Israel. Sometimes it is. In this context, it isn't because who's our transgressions there? Our is the people of Israel. So the people of Israel pierce for the people of Israel's transgressions. That doesn't make any sense. Our. It makes zero sense. This is an individual who is the embodiment of Israel. He's the ultimate servant of Israel. He's the servant par excellence. He's the ultimate representative of Israel. It is an individual. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. So his atonement is going to bring peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we, all we like sheep, have gone astray. But we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Further going to show this is not somehow the nation of Israel as a whole. Because he's saying, no, we as the people of Israel have gone astray. But this one that is in contrast to the people of Israel, an individual, is going to atone for us all. So again, you can't read this if you're going to say the servant of the Lord here is the nation of Israel. Because elsewhere in Isaiah, the servant of the Lord can be Israel as a whole. That, that doesn't follow here because in the context, Israel as a whole is being contrasted with this individual who's going to atone for Israel. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Does that sound familiar? It's what Jesus did. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Again, the Gospels refer to this. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living. So he, he's, he's going to be killed. Stricken for the transgression of my people. He's going to be killed, and it will be for an atonement for Israel. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. So he was pure. He was not a sinner. He was righteous. And again, when according to Daniel, would the Messiah be cut off? Well, 490 years from the decree of Artaxerxes. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. That's a prophecy of the resurrection. He'll prolong his day. He was, he was cut off, but God is going to prolong his days. That sounds like a resurrection. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. 
By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Again, why is this not the nation of Israel as a whole? Because here it is telling you this one will make many righteous. And who are these that are being righteous? Israel in the context. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. He was considered a sinner by many. He was numbered with the transgressors, and yet there was no deceit in his mouth. He was not a sinner, but he was treated as one. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. And then after that, by the way, you have a prophecy of the eternal covenant, <laughs> an eternal covenant of peace. What did we just see in Daniel? Also, a, an everlasting righteousness that is going to be brought in, a covenant and that will bring about peace. Again, it is referring to the atonement of Jesus, the Messiah. So this is why, to kind of um, maybe push back on what Dennis Prager was saying there, this is why we don't have a sacrificial system anymore. And I know that Prager is going to say, well, that's kind of like over-spiritualizing sacrifice when you don't have that concrete, tangible sacrificial system. But not really, because we, we do still have the Eucharistic sacrifice, and that's very tangible, and that's very concrete. So we still have the best of both worlds. It's not something metaphorical that's just completely spiritualized. It is tangible. You can go and receive that Eucharistic sacrifice at every Mass, at every liturgy. So Reason and Theology is growing as a channel. As a result, there's been a number of increases in production costs. So if you're benefiting from RNT, I ask that you consider supporting the channel. You can help out by contributing to the Help RNT Grow fundraiser on GoFundMe. You could also consider becoming a member on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Reason and Theology or become a channel member right here on YouTube. With either of these options, Patreon or a YouTube member, you'll get extra access to patron-only content. You can also donate directly to RNT at PayPal if you prefer that option. And you can find links to all of these resources and ways to support RNT in the show description. God bless.